good. So we have uh, the pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Martin Zierlein of the MIT in Boston. Uh, Professor Zierlein studied in 1998 at the University of Bonn and at the Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. Uh, he did in 2006, in 2006 a PhD at MIT in Boston on Bose-Einstein condensation of molecules uh, of molecular fermion pairs. And then he was a research assistant at MIT, research associate at the University of Mainz, and faculty member uh, of MIT, where he's professor since 2013. He has gotten many honors and awards, uh, among them the Sofia Kowalskaya Award of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and is presently Thomas Frank Professor of Physics at MIT and principal investigator in the Research Laboratory of Electronics and the Center of Ultracold Atoms. He is performing studies on strongly interacting fermions, gases of atoms and molecules, investigating novel state of matters, uh, which can uh, uh, represent a, a useful model for, for other fermion systems, like, such as neutron star or, or, or high temperature superconductors. And he will uh, show his result on experiments with what are called quantum gases. So I give you to, uh, to you the word, uh, Professor Zweil. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for the um, opportunity to, to uh, discuss with you today. Um, I, I gather this might be a, a quite a quite a different angle on on the subject of of uh, experiments. Uh, it might be interesting to to get a glimpse of what we what we do in our our labs. And as you will see, this is very much connected with a very famous Italian, Enrico Fermi. Um, I, 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 my research is on Fermi gases, and so uh, I, I hope to tell you a little bit about. Um, this, the magic that unfolds. I want to start very simple with questions you might already have from the title. Ultra-cold atomic gases, what are those? What does ultra-cold even mean? Well, what we have is actually the coldest matter in the universe, unless maybe some alien species has also come up with better methods to cool. <laughs> um, what is temperature even? Uh, well, temperature is a measure of energy and in particular energy of motion, like how, how fast do the atoms uh, move around. And uh, we, of course, love uh, various temperature scales like uh, the Celsius scale or the Fahrenheit scale to measure temperature and heat. And of course, at 100 degrees Celsius, water boils, at zero degrees, water freezes. The physicists um, don't like this, these scales so much because there is actually an absolute zero of temperature where all motion stops. And this comes in very strange numbers, minus 273 Celsius. So we don't like this. We instead use the Kelvin scale where everything starts from zero. Zero Kelvin means all motion stops. That of course means we live at 300 Kelvin, but that's fine. <laughs> if someone asked you on the street, why can't we cool below minus 273 degrees Celsius? You can answer, because there's no energy left. I have lost all that energy. And that's what the Kelvin scale is so good at. It measures directly the amount of energy that's left in my system. So now how cold is it in our laboratories? It's actually nano Kelvin. That's more than a million times colder than interstellar space. We don't have to wear space suits. It's all happening in a vacuum chamber, don't worry. Um, but it's very, very cold. <laughs> Now, what happens to atoms at low temperature? Here's a temperature scale going from um, uh, uh, very hot temperatures inside a supernova explosion at a billion Kelvin, um, all the way down to the temperature that we like, our living room here, which is at 300 Kelvin, and further to the left going into outer space. That's just a few Kelvin. And ultra-cold atom experiments are down here at the nano Kelvin scale. What happens to atoms? Well, if I was in a supernova explosion, I could get to you in 10 seconds. Unfortunately, not in one piece, uh, but at least um, it's fast. <laughs> the atoms in the room here, they move around at hundreds of meters per second. 
You don't think about it every day, but they're really kind of fast at the speed of an airplane. At our temperatures, atoms move at millimeters per second, the speed of a snail. So they slow down. But is that all? I mean, that sounds a slight bit boring, right? What if we keep cooling? Do they just stop and that's it? So no, actually. Instead, something magical happens, and it's not magic, but physics. <laughs> they lose their identity and decide to all do the same thing. Sometimes one says they march in lockstep, which sounds a little bit uh, militaristic, but this is a picture that science uh, made for uh, the cover 1995, the observation of Bose-Einstein condensation, which shows some hot atoms running around at random speeds on different colors. And here, all those blue atoms deciding to swim in one and the same wave, the Bose-Einstein condensate. So if someone asks you, what are the different states of matter? You can answer, well, gas, liquid, solid, and plasma, but also Bose-Einstein condensates. Let me maybe first tell you a bit about the cooling methods because it might be fascinating to, to see how we can cool that, that low. There are actually only two methods you have to uh, learn about. It's laser cooling and evaporative cooling. It sounds fancy, but I will explain. Laser cooling is simply the use of light to slow down atoms, which sounds strange because in Star Trek or Star Wars, you usually see lasers being used to blow up things and make things, I guess, very hot. But if you use the laser light in a clever way, it actually cools the atoms. So when an atom hits a photon, it actually absorbs that photon. And it not only absorbs the energy, but also the impulse, the momentum carried by this photon. So it gets a kick, just as if it was hit by a billiard ball. And so it slows down. Wonderful, we like that, we want to cool. But of course, after some while, it emits the photon again. However, that's occurring in a random direction. And so I can just repeat this step, and again, it will get a little kick from the front and slow down even further. It's a bit like trying to slow down a police car using lots of baseballs, and that clearly that's a very American uh, analogy that I'm presenting here. I play soccer. Um, so what, how do we do it in the experiment? We have to get our hands on some atoms, right? So we just buy a piece of metal, cheap as it gets, sodium, for example. It's, a, it's solid at room temperature. So we need to heat it up to 400 degrees Celsius. So that's actually kind of a hot gas. You might say that's a very bad idea to eventually go to low temperatures. But at least you get individual atoms that are running around um, and, uh, and propagate along this tube. This is all happening in a big vacuum chamber. So we don't have to you know, expose it to air. This is all happening in vacuum. And from the front, we bombard these atoms with laser light. And so they slow down. And in fact, it doesn't take a long time. It takes just a few milliseconds to slow down a beam of these 400 degrees Celsius hot atoms to uh, the speed on the order of meters per second. So that's temperature already of a milli Kelvin right there in a millisecond. It's very fast. And the experiment is, is not big. It's on the meter scale. So a few graduate students in the room can still work on this experiment. Uh, to give a real picture, this is one of our favorite uh, experiments. It's actually the first experiment where sodium was condensed, was formed a, uh, into a Bose-Einstein condensate in 1995 by Wolfgang Ketterle. And uh, I inherited this experiment. Uh, and it's hilarious, after 26 years, it's still going strong and producing cold atoms. You see, there is a lot of mirrors going on, at many complicated things, but at the heart of it, it's a, a stainless steel vacuum chamber with lasers going in from all kinds of directions. It's very colorful. If you do this laser cooling, you actually can see inside the vacuum chamber a beautiful glowing ball of atoms here hovering in midair, and it's not midair, but mid vacuum, because there's no air inside, um, where we have a beautiful cloud of a million or sometimes a billion atoms uh, cooled to a millikelvin. 
That's a great starting point, but we need to get colder. I told you I promised nano Kelvin. So we need another technique to get even colder. That's called evaporative cooling. This is what happens to my coffee right now. I just let it sit there and the hot coffee particles go away and the cold coffee particles remain and to be thermalized and the coffee gets colder so that I hopefully at some point can drink it. That's all there is to it. Um, I have to do this in my vacuum chamber in a very special kind of cup. It's actually a magnetic trap holding the atoms because they're little magnetic needles that I can hold on to. But the principle is really the same as cooling your coffee. And um, this was realized by these gentlemen, Tom Greitek and Dan Kleppner, uh, uh, my uh, senior colleagues at MIT. Now, how do you see that you're, you, you made progress, that you actually cooled the gas a little bit further? Well, it's kind of simple. Let's say this red dot is the trapped atom cloud and I want to check how cold it is. I just switch off my trap and the atoms will expand. Um, so this is supposed to be a whole cloud of many, many atoms, right? And its size will expand. And then I can just take a laser beam. Uh, the laser beam will get absorbed by the atoms. So I will have a shadow picture on my camera. So it's very nice. It's, it's like uh, in, in Platon where you see the reality of the world, uh, not directly in front of you, but you only see the shadows on the walls of what's actually happening. Uh, so we see these shadow images of our atoms. And the size of this shadow tells us how far away the atoms have flown. So I know how hot they are. Now, this is what happened in 1995. That was before I was born. I'm kidding, but I wasn't there. This was happening in this experiment I just showed you. They cooled the gas of sodium and got it colder and colder, but one at one moment, they saw a very cold and dense spot appear in the center of their cloud. That was the birth of the Bose-Einstein condensate, a very large ensemble of very cold atoms. And that was a phase transition, as we say in physics, but it was not only a phase transition in the gas, but a phase transition for the entire field that, that we work in, atomic physics, because now we had these samples of very cold atoms at our disposition. And the next 25 years have seen an enormous flurry of activities, many, many labs around the world uh, studying these interesting new states of matter and um, uh, trying to understand how atoms behave when they are all together at low temperature. This is the lab book entry from that night, which is my, maybe nice to see how, you know, Oh, there are these scribbles and scratch out lines and everything is a bit hectic. But at the end, <laughs> there is this BEC exclamation mark, Bose-Einstein condensation is achieved with a small little question mark, <laughs> which tells you, you should always check your experiment. They came back the next day. You see, this was very late at night. This was at six o'clock in the morning, actually. So they were still going strong over the night. They checked the next day. It was still there. And, uh, you know, that gets you the Nobel Prize here uh, for Eric Cornell, Carl Wyman, and Wolfgang Ketterle, uh, who is my mentor at, um, at, at uh, MIT. Again, I had nothing to do with this. I'm just uh, proudly telling you the story of what made this, uh, what made this field explode. What is Bose-Einstein condensation in one sentence? It's the creation of laser-like atoms. Why am I saying that? Well, let's think of the light from a light bulb. It sends light in all kinds of directions with all kinds of colors. It's a whole spectrum. But the light of a laser is very pure. It's directed, so only in one direction, and it's only one color. So all these light particles do the same thing. Well, that's exactly what happens in a Bose-Einstein condensate. A hot thermal gas, well, that's many different distinguishable atoms that are doing their own thing. They don't care about each other. But at low temperatures in the condensate, you have all the atoms doing one and the same thing in one big, we say, matter wave. In fact, what really nailed the Nobel Prize for Wolfgang Ketterle was to demonstrate that these Bose-Einstein condensates behave as waves. You can take one condensate and another condensate, overlap them just like two laser beams and you see beautiful 
interference fringes, as we say, so regions where there are no atoms and regions where there are more atoms than you think. So they behave as waves and you can take pictures using this absorption technique I just said to demonstrate this. Also, it's a bit more subtle, but fascinating. Atoms actually flow without friction in a condensate. It flows through any cracks, through any little gaps. They're actually super fluid, as we say. So that's actually very important that I will, I will tell you in a, in a bit why. But first I have to get to Fermi. <laughs> Can all particles form a condensate? No, the answer is no. Now let's check. Each particle in the universe belongs only to one of two groups, which is nice, even you right now. Either you are a fermion, then that's named after Enrico Fermi, or you are a boson named after Bose. What decides which one you are? It's the number of elementary particles you are made out of. The protons, the neutrons and the electrons, all of those that make up your body. You count them. If the number is uneven, you're a fermion. If the number is even, you're a boson. Examples for fermions are electrons. Well, electron, one electron, that's an uneven number, right? So it's a fermion. Lithium-6 is my favorite atom. It has three protons, three neutrons, three electrons. That's nine. Oh, it's a fermion. Hydrogen is a famous boson. It's an proton surrounded by an electron. So that's two that makes a boson. Sodium-23, which we love to work with also, is also a boson. You have to count a bit more, but then you find it's 34. Aha, sodium is a boson. They behave very differently at low temperatures. If you are a fermion, you cannot be in the same state as another fermion. They have to occupy different states. And this cartoon says it very nicely. You see, they're sort of antisocial. Uh, this guy is spying on the others. This guy is listening to some music uh, in solitary ways. This guy is, for the experts, Pauli blocking uh, him or herself. Antisocial. The bosons are the happy particles. They form this condensate at low temperatures, as I showed, and they even help each other into this condensate, a phenomenon called bosonic stimulation. So very different behaviors. But why doesn't this suddenly happen to me? Maybe there are all kinds of other margins around with which I could now condense and form a post condensate. Well, actually, it depends uh, whether you have to worry about it or not. At high temperatures, you don't have to worry about this story. There, you can really think of atoms as being little billiard balls running around and bumping into each other, no problem. But at low temperatures, particles start to behave as waves. We learn this from quantum mechanics. We cannot possibly know with infinite precision where a particle is. That would mean we know nothing about its velocity and vice versa. So if I cool down a gas and I start to know better and better how fast it is, I no longer know where it is. Each particle diffuses sort of over a certain region. And that's OK at high temperatures, but at low temperatures, you get into this situation where these waves that each particle uh, is described by, they start to overlap and they no longer know where each particle is. Bosons now suddenly say, let's all form one big wave. This is a nice cartoon picture of a Bose-Einstein condensate. Fermions hate each other. They cannot be on top of each other. They have to spread out and form this sort of if you want this sort of crystalline state uh, in this artist's conception. Turns out we now can take pictures that look very much like this. So the condition is you have to cool so much that you see this uncertainty where every particle is, this, this wave uh, uh, length that has to be on the order of the distance to other particles. And now you can ask, how cold do you have to get for a certain uh, distance between particles? If you want to ever touch a quantum degenerate Fermi gas, no problem. Just touch the nearest metal to you. Because metals are very degenerate electron gases, it turns out. And electrons are fermions. Wonderful. 
So you can hold it in your hand today. <laughs> um, you also find these Fermi gases in um, uh, very distant objects, neutron stars, for example. They are held together against further collapse by Pauli pressure, by this, by this, by this fact that they cannot be on top of each other. But for our ultra cold gases, we work at very low densities, so we have to cool a lot. We have to cool below roughly a micro Kelvin to see any interesting physics in that respect. I love fermions because they make everything around us. It turns out all the uh, massive particles, elementary particles that you can think of are fermions. So the atoms, of course, the nuclei, the neutron stars, they're all made out of a bunch of fermions that get together. The fundamental problem is they cannot possibly be at the same place, as I told you. And that's something that I cannot teach my computer. So if I try to calculate anything about strongly interacting fermions, my computer cannot do it, which is where the experimentalist comes out. That's why I love doing experiments. We can work with actual fermions and see what nature does with them. This problem is severe because um, if you remember, electrons are fermions, they rule our world, and it turns out we don't understand how they uh, transport energy effectively. We lose 10% of our energy just to transport electrons from A to B. Um, wouldn't it be nice to have superconductors where you transport electricity without any loss? Well, that's precisely what was observed 100 years ago by Kamerling Onnes. If you cool electrons below 4 Kelvin on the order, he saw that the resistiv resistivity dropped to zero. So fermions can also apparently behave as waves and somehow manage to condense. We haven't gone too high up uh, in these 100 years. Our record today for superconductivity is roughly minus 100 degrees Celsius. It would be so nice to have high temperature superconductors because room temperature superconductors even. Then my laptop wouldn't get hot. I wouldn't lose any energy when I transport my fermions. So we need to understand superfluidity and superconductivity. And that's what my research group does. Superfluidity and superconductivity are basically uh, very similar things. There's no energy loss, there's persistent flow, um, and current can flow without resistance. And um, when you ask now, wait, how do the fermions do that? You ask a question that took uh, people 50 years to figure out. Apparently, we have fermions that run without friction. They cannot possibly be a condensate, right? I told you they don't want to be on top of each other. But turns out, they can pair up two electrons. Well, that's two elementary particles. That's a boson. So pairs of electrons can condense. And that's what superconductivity is. It's the condensation of electron pairs. Can we do this with atoms? Well, we have a nice Fermi gas in, in our lab, laser cooled. It's beautifully red, lithium-6. And we can actually um, cool it and make these fermions pair up like electrons in a superconductor. And then, well, we have some knobs and bells and whistles. We can play with the pair size, which is fascinating. Most importantly, this gas becomes super fluid. And maybe just to, just to uh, uh, show you how to distinguish a super fluid from a normal one when you have it, very easy, just rotate it. If I rotate my cup of coffee or a bucket of water, it will not do much, you know, it will probably have this nice meniscus going on, you know, the water will start to creep up the walls, but nothing special will happen. The superfluid cannot do that. It actually will develop these vortices, mini quantum tornadoes um, that, that pierce the bucket. So if you look from top of, the, of this bucket of superfluid, you will actually have a beautiful lattice of mini tornadoes flowing through the soup. And that's precisely because these superfluids are described by waves. And it turns out, and that's of course a bit difficult to explain in, in a second, that they really like to flow in this fashion and not have one big whirlpool in the middle like you know from your bathtub. So that's basically what we did in the lab. We wrote it our Fermi gas and checked whether it actually had these vortices. So we took spoons, 
these spoons were laser beams, waited a little bit and saw after a while a beautiful vortex lattice appear in our gas. So that was the demonstration that we had formed a superfluid of fermion pairs. And now comes the, the fascinating point. This was all happening at low densities and low temperatures. But if you scale the density of our gas up to the gas, up to the density of electrons in a metal, the gas would become superfluid far above room temperature. So there is hope. You know, we can maybe find a way one day to make electrons superconduct at room temperature. We don't know yet how to do it, but uh, it is in principle possible. Nothing says that that should not work. So I guess I'm out of time, but uh, I guess with that hopeful message, I can uh, end the talk and just thank um, uh, quickly my, my, my group uh, at MIT who have done fascinating experiments over the, the past years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the beautiful uh, uh, talk. And now we have time for some, for some questions. Uh, Franco. Um, well, thank you very much. This was really a lovely talk and I'm very impressed at how cleverly you managed to simply explain very difficult things. That's really a gift and it's very good. Um, my question is slightly more complicated, but not much because um, the la 10 years ago, or more or less, people began to look at uh, super fluid gases and also ultra cold atoms to detect what they were called at the time. And they turned out to be Efimov states, which was a property of some of these atoms. Now, it is something that you can as nicely explain to the people because Efimov had suggested these things in the 70s. And in fact, it was only in 2010 20, that something like that was actually seen in experiments. Beautiful. So let, let me let me uh, explain it. it. It has a connection to, I think, an Italian family, right? The Borromean uh, seal was um, showing three rings which uh, are only held together if they're all three together. Um, by the way, this background image just shows that we can see single atoms uh, these days. And, and now you can uh, ask, what is an Efimov state? An Efimov state would be a state where three atoms get together and form a trimer. So here it's not happening in this picture, but you can imagine that that might be something that can happen. And the beautiful thing about these Efimov states is that um, it can be such that two at the three atoms are only held together if they're all three in the same place. If one is missing, there is no bound state for two atoms. And that's the fantastic thing about these Efimov states. They're like this Boromian seal with the three rings that nice. are knotted in such a way that they cannot exist. They, they, they will split the moment you remove one of the rings. So that's the essence of Efimov. And um, how it comes about is um, not so different from how atoms can form molecules, so two atoms can form a pair. Um, it can be a molecule, so there is an attraction between the two atoms. And if you have strong enough attraction, you can form a pair. The, the magic is what Efimov found, is that even if you don't quite have enough attraction to bind two atoms, you can actually find a state where three atoms are uh, bound together. So it's a little bit easier to form, in some ways, to, to form trimers than to form dimers in a certain regime of uh, in intellection strength. And this was seen first by the group of Rudy Grimm in Innsbruck. And since then, there has been also a flurry of activity in finding more of these Efimov uh, states. And they have been found in many types of atoms these days. And they're very relevant also for understanding um, uh, uh, excited states of helium and nuclear matter. So you can also ask whether there's an Efimov state of, of three neutrons. Um, there's some faint evidence that that might be the case. So it's beautiful to see how these, uh, how, how these fundamental questions that were solved on paper 50 years ago, they can now be accessed in the laboratory. 
and we can tune the interactions in cold atoms. We can make the FEMOV states bound or unbound and study uh, th their binding, th therefore, uh, which is much easier to do than if you try to find an FEMOV state of three neutrons. For that, you have to have some accelerator and lots of money, <laughs> way more than, than we have at our disposition. Yes, the trick, as you well said, is that the interactions have to be very weak. So in order to even those atoms feel that weak interaction, you have to really cool down them a lot. But it is a fascinating idea that you can actually get those three atoms together while two of them would not stick yes. together. I remember they organized a meeting in Rome a few years back where I invited Efimov from his little college to come. And any time that somebody showed a transparency where you would see an Efimov state through a resonance, he got up and kissed the speaker. So that was quite a, a meeting at the time. It was. It's very emotional. <laughs> it's nice. Passion. But that was only. He didn't have time to give three kisses. One was just enough at the time. Thank that's you very wonderful. much. Anyway, that's a lovely explanation. That's wonderful. I, I mean, actually, you have Borromean nuclei in which you you have just exactly this kind of behavior. Yes, yes, but I then the different forces. Um, uh, I have a curiosity. Uh, which number? Which is the number of, of atoms that you can trap uh, in one of these measurements you were showing? Uh, yeah. So the the picture on the vortex lattice that was up to ten million atoms nice. in in this Fermi gas, um, which is actually I think still kind of a record because usually it's difficult. Usually when you evaporatively cool your fermions. Uh, it's it's difficult because at some point they don't meet anymore. They don't collide because they don't want to be on top of each other. So you have to play tricks. You have to put another spin state in there or another species. And um, in, in our case, we use sodium. Uh, clearly, we are at MIT. We have to use sodium uh, to cool a gas of, of lithium atoms. Um, and that allows us to save a lot of the fermions. Um, they only sympathetically cool. We don't lose them. And so we get 10 million, which is kind of nice. In this picture, you see maybe uh, you know a few hundreds. Um, th th these are this is a new method where we can actually see every single atom using uh, their fluorescence. They fluoresce light, and we can detect this on the camera. Those experiments um, happen in in optical lattices, and we we usually don't even need or want millions of atoms. We are very happy with you know hundreds would be fine. Already, that's impossible to calculate on the computer. But on a good day, we now have, um, you know, we have we have thousand or so, and we are happy, and we see new states of metal, like metal as a new, well, new and old <laughs> metals and insulators, just now under the microscope with single atom resolution. Okay, and they, they keep in the same status basically forever, or? Uh... Uh, well, so that's a good question. How long can we observe these things and before they 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 uh, realize that? They should probably at some point warm up. So uh, there is actually a problem, and it's connected in some ways with Efimov. Um, sodium at room temperature already is a solid. So at nano Kelvin, I'm sure it's going to be a solid still, right? So in order to even do any experiments with these gases, we have to make them very, very dilute so that they don't meet each other in threes or fours or fives, so that they cannot form clusters and form actually metal. So that's a challenge. So we have to work with gases a million times thinner than air. And that gives us roughly about a minute before they actually do find each other and form trimers and clusters and more deeply bound states. And then they're lost uh, for us. There is another limit which is similar, um, which, is, well, it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's actually the fact that our vacuum is not perfect. We cannot make perfect vacuum. There's still about 100,000 particles per cubic centimeter of hot stuff, usually hydrogen, in our vacuum chamber. So they sometimes hit our precious cold atoms, and then they're also immediately lost from the trap. So these days, uh, that, that what, that's what limits us to a minute or so, that we can play with these atoms um, and, and work with them before we have to reload a new cloud. So I, I don't see other questions. Uh, 
Franco, I see you still you are. Um, do you have other question? I, I didn't want to take over the thing, but one of the fascinating problems, of course, is to see whether you can do that. Not dimers of lithium that you splendidly showed, but if you can do that with the etero molecule, something I don't know, like LIH or LIH plus. Yes. Uh, Beautiful. I so actually one of my labs is cooling down molecules, and oh, it's a very funny molecule. It's a sodium potassium dimer, which yes. in its ground state has a strong electric dipole yeah. moment. Yes. And because the potassium atom is a fermion and the sodium is a boson, the molecule is a fermion. So the goal yeah. is eventually to pair up these molecules. They will have a strong dipole moment. And then you have a Fermi gas with very interesting long range dipolar interactions. So then it matters uh, which way the dipoles of the molecules point. You know, do they align and yes. do they meet like this? Then they repel or they meet head to tail, then they attract. That would be fascinating, and it it has you know occupied me for for the last eight years to try to reach this. And uh, five years ago, we managed to even get these cold molecules near this degeneracy temperature, but so far they actually still undergo chemical reactions in the presence of the laser light. So yes. we have to trap them in the dark, and it's just a bit difficult, I must say. Um, we're still yes. working on it. <laughs> Wonderful. Good luck. It's really fascinating. Thank you. It's very hard. <laughs> Thank you.